I'm Roy Gibson, I'm president of the uh, Roman Society, and this has been organised in consultation room with uh, my colleague Paul Cartage, who is um, president of the Leading Society. And today's colloquium is changing attitudes to the Olympic Games. We're going to hear later on from uh, Tom Scans, Tom Scanlon, from Shushma Malik, and from the Ad Mada Theatre Company. We're just going to do four presentations in a row, four short presentations, and we'll have questions at the end. Uh, first of all, um, this is um, there's a handout at the back uh, by the door. If anyone doesn't have it and would like to just go up and get a copy now, please go ahead and feel feel free uh, there. But the first paper is, of course, by Paul himself, who is the Emeritus Leventus Professor of Greek Culture at the University of Cambridge. And he's going to talk today on was there an ancient Hellenic Olympic ideal? Paul. So as Roy said, uh, I am Paul Kalanich, and uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming. The idea, of course, came because this is the centenary year of the 1924 Paris Olympics, which are sometimes referred to as the Chariots of Fire Olympics, because that was the year in which Harold Abrahams won the 100 meters and Eric Nadell won the 400 meters. And there's a wonderful book, a little book, which I was given when I was uh, nine years old. And it was the book, the official English version, English, England English version of the Melbourne Olympics, 1956. So I have been fascinated by and indeed enthralled by the Olympics way before I had any notion that I might one day become a Hellenist or have any as I put it here, skin in the game. I've provided you with an old fashioned sort of handout. I, I don't know when you last had a handout, but um, when I was teaching in Cambridge, I gave up teaching 10 years ago. I still managed to get away with um, using handouts as opposed to PowerPoints. Anyway, I love PowerPoints, don't, don't get me wrong, but the point about this is partly something you can doodle on and something you can take away after if you want to follow up and if you want to disagree, if you want to clarify, whatever, whatever, there is a handout, not just for now, but it is actually a summary of what I'm going to say. I'm going to be quite quick. I'm going to uh, be the curtain raiser for this event. So I've written on the ancient Olympics as a religious festival. I've written on Olympia as a site of Pan-Hellenism, that is where all Greeks and only Greeks in principle, got together. And not only for the Olympic Games, of course, the actual site of Olympia was in regular use throughout the year. There was an oracle there, as well as all the other types of shrines, as well as the four yearly uh, athletic, mainly, and equestrian celebration. And I've taken part with my former student, Clare College student, Matt Stadlin. You may have come across him as a broadcaster, radio, and uh, television. And he used to have a series where he would uh, follow somebody, maybe a concert pianist or a royal ballet dancer, and the program would be condensed into half an hour. And we, Matt and I, for the 2012, 2012 Olympics, we went off together with a cameraman, with a sound man, to Olympia. And of course, we ran the stage, the stadion, and of course, he being, what, 30, 40 years younger than I am, he, <laughs> he got to the end rather more quickly than I did, at any rate. And then another friend of mine is a journalist called Tony Perrote. He's actually Australian, but he lives in New York. And he wrote a book called The Naked Olympics, and he's a very amusing runner, and so it's not entirely uh, a writer as well as run. It's not an entirely serious account of the ancient Olympics, but uh, I recommend that. And so where I put on the handout Perote 2004, you have to refer to the references handout and you'll find Tony's book there. So what we do when we study the Olympics is a variety of what is, I suppose, the biggest growth area of classical and therefore Hellenic studies 
altogether, which is what we call reception studies. Now, you might say, what the hell's the difference between just studying the ancient Greeks and Romans and reception studies? Well, what it means is how people since the ancient, so depending what your cutoff point is, if you think the ancient world ends before the early Byzantine world, for example, you take the 4th century CEAD as your cutoff. So anything after that is reception of. Anybody who looks back from the 5th century AD through to the 21st century is doing a form of reception studies. Well, some topics lend themselves far more obviously than others, and there is none, I think, that lends itself more to the reception study approach than the Olympics. The word is the very same. Ah, but that's um, really just the start of the problem. Let me just give you the first of many, many, many differences between any modern, we now use the word, iteration of the modern Olympics and any ancient uh, iteration of it in antiquity. Two points just to start with. First, the ancient games, whenever you think they really began, began sometime in the 8th century BC, BCE. They went on without a break every four years until the 390s AD, when they were closed down by an Orthodox Catholic Christian emperor, a Byzantine or a Roman, East Roman emperor. Without a break, 1100 years or so. The modern Olympics were founded in 1896. They didn't occur in 1914, 16, within the First World War. They didn't occur within the Second World War, 1940, 1944. So there's something different, isn't there? about the motivation for the social positioning of the cultural reception of the modern Olympics from their place in the ancient world's culture. Second general point, before I get to lots more. Today we celebrate first the Olympics. Of course, there's also a winter Olympics, but I'm, I'm just concentrating on the summer Olympics, which is followed by a para-Olympics. The ancients, at any rate, the ancient Greeks, were the very reverse of diverse and inclusive and tolerant of disability, deformity, anything which was not, as it were, normal and normative. And since the Olympic Games were one of those modes of physical expression where peak both fitness and attainment and excellence were just absolutely desired. Anything less than perfection was rather looked down upon. The notion of there being a Paralympic game would have occurred to absolutely no ancient Hellene. So why has there been a modern Olympics and a modern Olympics movement since the late 19th century? I put on the handout that Pierre Baron de Coubertin was the only begetter of the modern Olympic movement. Of course, he wasn't the only, but he was the prime mover. And he was a French aristocrat, a very old aristocratic family. And one of the odd things about him was that he was an Anglophile. Not many French people, on average, typically are ravingly Anglophile. And I'm sorry to say it's true of us Brits. I personally am a desperate Francophile, but there are very few among us, I have to say. So you're anyway, right. De Coubertin came over to England, and you'll see in little square brackets, before the modern Olympics, 1896, there were two versions of, quotes Olympic games going on in England. They were going on then. They're still going on, quite extraordinarily. One founded by Robert Dover in 1612 in the Cotswolds, the other at Much Wenlock in Shropshire, founded by Dr. William Penny Brooks in 1850. And Baron de Coubertin noticed when he visited 
the much win look Olympics 1890, just four years before the main meeting, the International Congress, which agreed to hold a modern Olympics in Athens in 1896. Well, the connection that de Coubertin drew <laughs> is somewhat surprising. In 1870, the French lost a major battle to the Prussian Germans, Battle of Sedol. Why had they lost? He drew the inference that it was because, unlike the British, who had public schools, private schools, where they a privilege, they put a big emphasis on masculine sports. French had neither the sorts of public schools nor the sorts of sport programs at their schools. And the way he referenced it, the way he put it in historical context was by quoting the Duke of Wellington. Now, the Duke of Wellington was an old Etonian. That's what O-E on the handout means. And he won, if he won, it's rather like the Second World War. Um, he didn't win it all by himself, shall we say. But at any rate, the Battle of Waterloo, 1815, was, according to him, as he looked back, won on the playing fields of Eton. Absolute nonsense in one sense, but de Coubertin fastened on that and made the connection between public schools, private schools, masculine sports, doing well in battle. And so he came up with the Olympic idea. And he presided over the first seven holdings of the modern Olympics from 1896 to 1924. And it was in the 1924 Games, which is 100 years ago, that the Olympic slogan, the three rather sadly Latin uh, comparative adverbs, um, <laughs> Citius, Altius, Fortius, became the slogan of uh, the Games. Seven years later, looking back, when he'd since retired from being president of the International Olympic Committee, he wrote memoirs, which he had published in Lausanne, which has been the headquarters of the Olympic movement for many, many years. And in 1935, just four years later, and at the time, one year before the Hitler Games of Berlin, 1936, he knew the games were going to be happening then. He went to a uh, radio studio in Geneva in order to reiterate the Olympic ideal as he saw it from one particular point of view. Namely, the games were supposed, as I'll shortly come back to, not to promote nationalism. The first competitors at the first Olympics did not compete as Americans or British or whatever. They competed as themselves. And de Coubertin saw the Games as anti-nationalist. They were to be a forum where people from different nations came together. They competed, yes, but not in a nasty way and with a view to reinforcing what they had in common rather than what they did not have in common. So what other factors did he have to um, help him along his way in getting the Games 1896? Well, a very, very big one was, of course, that in 1875, German Archaeological Institute began, with the Greek government's um, acquiescence, the series of excavations which have gone on ever since. And the site of Olympia had been rediscovered by an Englishman, rediscovered because in the 6th century the whole thing was flooded and a uh, whole lot of uh, mud and there'd been earthquakes and so on. The site was literally not visible. People knew roughly where it was. But it wasn't until 1766 that Richard Chandler, representing the Dilettante Society of London, which is an ancestor of the Society of Antiquaries of London, actually as on the ground, um, registered where it had been. And I put on the handout a number of works, including an edited volume by Wendy Rasker, who happens to be somewhat connected with Tom Scanlon uh, on the handout. But there's a ton of work I'm currently reading for review, Judith Barringer's exhaustive, I would say also exhausting uh, account of the archaeology of uh, Olympia. So, 1894, International Congress in Paris noticed 
um, Paris and France being, he was of course French, but also uh, international in a way perhaps it isn't quite any longer. Uh, French as an international language has had to give way very often now to English and so on. So that was an obvious place to hold such a meeting. And in 1896, the first iteration, the first modern games was held in Athens, actually about this time of year, the very first day of the 1896 games was not surprisingly Greece's national day, which is yesterday, March the 25th, Lady Day, the, Ass the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, and the day on which a priest in uh, northern Peloponnese declared liberation from the Ottoman Turks in uh, 1821. So the first modern games, brilliantly uh, assessed by a colleague of ours, Sir Michael Llewellyn Smith. He read uh, Greats, as it used to be called, at New College Oxford, as I did. He became our ambassador in Athens, among many other distinctions. And then I've ended the first page of your handout with the London Games, because there's a view that the 1908 London Games marks really the beginning of the seriously well, quasi-professional, don't tell the Kubatil, but it's starting to get something more like we assume the standards and the practices that go into producing the standards that are now absolutely taken for granted. Professionalism was not allowed formally until 1988. If you were a professional athlete, you could not perform in the Olympics technically as a professional. It's a bit like Wimbledon and tennis and so on until the late 80s. And there's a recent book, I put it on the handout, which is all about um, the role played by Lord Desborough. He was, as it were, the Pierre de Coubertin of the 1908 games. So if we move on the other side of your handout to the modern Olympic ideal, the point of my talk is to briefly outline what de Coubertin and those who agreed with him in 1896 thought they were instituting, why they were instituting it, and what they hoped to achieve by instituting it. And running through all that is this notion of an Olympic ideal or an Olympic spirit which contributes to an Olympic movement. All these words are still around, um, but they were formulated first in the 1890s. And as I put it, it was an unstable compound because, of course, society changes and therefore the Olympics has to change. It can't remain uh, as it was in 1896. And it's a compound of gentlemanly, that's masculine, but of a certain kind of masculinity, not crude, brutish virility, but gentlemanly, so strength, but also a certain gentility. Uh, amateurism, of course, a word of Latin rather than Greek origin, and that's a little bit of a clue as to what I'm going to go on to say. Gentlemen, no women allowed. And as late as 1935, even though women had been allowed to compete in the Olympics from 1928, still in 1935, in that radio broadcast, personally, de Coubertin said, I do not approve of women's participation in public competition. But even though it was to be gentlemanly, it wasn't to be nude. And so there's one of the first uh, distinctions from the naked Olympics of the ancient world. Amateurism meant no payments, no cash prizes. There were prizes, but they weren't in hard cash. Participation was supposed to be undertaken for its own sake, so though it's desirable, to win. Winning was not all. And it's very interesting, Harold Abrahams, in that book I mentioned, 1956, he's um, writing a, a foreword to the 1956 Olympic Games book. He writes uh, with his own self in mind, to be second in a race is really worth no more than being last so far as public prestige is concerned. Now, the ancient Greeks would have absolutely cheered that to the wrath 
Kubits, but it's dead contrary to what de Coubertin and others thinking like him wanted, ideally, the Olympic ideal to be. Fair play was supposed to be the governing spirit. Um, how exactly that was supposed to play out, it was a supposedly English notion. I suppose cricket, you know, it's not cricket. If you use that phrase, you mean you're not playing fairly. So there is <clears throat> some sense in which there was an English ideal of fair play. Whether or not it was enacted, that's another issue. And then, as well as um, the athletics, Coubertin personally was very keen on art. There, there were Olympic prizes for visual art. Well, that actually was much more the case in the ancient Pythian Games at Delphi, not at Olympia, which, uh, though there's lots of artworks at Olympia, there were no prizes for artworks in an Olympics context. And then I've just added in here, was any part of the de Coubertin ideal what we now call um, equity, diversity, inclusion, or as some put that acronym, D-I-E, as opposed to E-D-I? Well, in 1924, which is the Paris Games, W.H. Hubbard of the United States, a black man, won the long jump. So there was competition involving non-white persons from a relatively early uh, stage in the series. And then coming back to the main point, really, politically, from the Coubertin's point of view, it was to be an anti-nationalistic, pro-peace movement, promoting amity among the comity of nations. And as some uh, Canadian and American commentators have pointed out the ideal of peace is written into the Olympic Charter, but it didn't exactly work, did it, in the sense of promoting peace, overriding what nation states wanted to do. There was no Olympic truce movement. You might have thought that might have been built into the original charter. It was totally consonant with the idea of peace until 1992 for Seoul Games, S-E-O-U-L. And uh, as I say there again, just to repeat, whereas the Vodnins have been interrupted three times, the ancient went on for 1,100 years or so without a break. Well, now, what do moderners make of de Coubertin's reception of the ancient Olympic Greek spirit, shall we say. Well, a couple of scholars have tried desperately to rescue something from amid the uh, ruins that links ancient, that is, their view of ancient Greece and de Coubertin's view. So Bernard emphasizes the notion of fraternity and Macrianakis emphasizes the notion of democracy. I personally struggle to see anything either very fraternal or democratic about, well, since 1908 at any rate. And uh, it's uh, amusing to me at, at any rate, there was apparently a real bust up between the American and the English competitors in London in 1908. And Abrahams commented, it's really rather remarkable the games continued after 1908. So bad were feelings then. Well, what about, this is now me, the historian speaking, um, look at all the ways in which the ancient games were actually fundamentally different from the modern ideal. George Orwell talking about professional sport with reference specifically to soccer, used the phrase war minus the shooting. So it was a paramilitary exercise. Well, that quite often applies also to a lot of what goes on within the modern Olympic continent. Think about the boycotts of 1980 and 1984, where politics went to such a degree that it influenced who competed, and let alone the spirit in which people could Competed. What about gentlemen amateurs? Well, yes, 
um, to begin with, and for many, many years, it was just um, men who were competing. Women came in only indirectly in the ancient games by way of owning horses or chariots so that they could become Olympic victors. And one of those is, I think, going to be talked about by Tom later. There were also women's running events at Olympia, but not at the same time as the main Olympic uh, festival celebration. What about fair play? Well, I've quoted here, the ancient Greek rule books seem to have passed over many tactics uh, we would consider the worst sort of dirty fighting. Well, the issue of sport is one that I've raised in my own work. I mean, were the ancient Olympics sporting? Well, I think probably not. If you've ever read Mary Renault's Last of the Wine, there's a wonderful description of the Pancration at the Isthmian Games, the very reverse of sporting in the sense of fair play. One giant uh, against, because there were no weight standards in the ancient world. There were no classes. True of boxing, true of pancration, which is the uh, mixed martial arts of its time. Spirit of contest was, um, I think, well summed up by the ancient Greek word agonia. It means literally competitiveness. It's where the English word agony comes from. So it's that sort of desperate. Uh, competitiveness involving considerable both mental and physical pain that uh, we should think the ancients were competing within. And it was winner takes all, as Abrahams was saying. That actually was the ancient Greek. I'd no silver or bronze medals in the ancient uh, Olympics. Religion, that really is the ultimate major difference which explains both the longevity, the continuity, and the difference why modern Olympics, though some athletes regard um, competing as a kind of religion, the actual uh, sports events themselves are not a religious observance in and for themselves. Peace and truce. Well, the ancient truce was a, an armistice. The Greek word eche charia means holding back one's hands. So it wasn't because we love peace and love and therefore we must have a truce because that's what peace. It's in order to enable competitors to compete and participants to view and to get back home without being killed. And there was a famous case at 364 BC when there was actually war going on in the Holy of Holies, the central space of Olympia, uh, in the Altis. There was a Panhellenic ideal. In other words, it's only for Greeks, the Olympics, like the Isthmian and the Nemean and the Pythian, but it was mainly negative. It's not only for us, but it's not for you guys, the rest of you who are inferior to us, the barbarians. Got to be problematic when the Romans conquered Greece. Are they barbarians or are they not? And of course, they, oddly enough, thought they weren't, and so they were allowed to compete. And then um, I'm just ended very briefly with the ultimate difference between any ancient, any modern conception, reception, and that's the marathon. The marathon was the idea of a, an ancient uh, Hellenist scholar, like a man called Michel Jayalol, but in the actual Olympics, the longest race, and it was called the long race, was, we think, 24 laps. So up and back, up and back, 24 times, times the stadion, which was 192.24 metres. So roughly 5,000 metres for us, middle distance. Marathon, totally unolympic, and yet it's actually very central to the way the Olympics has developed and it wasn't long until 1984 that women were allowed to run their marathon. So thank you very much.